my brother or sister's already existing form. Now, whichever approach you find more attractive depends on what you're looking for. For example, the looking around the home option takes more time and more effort, but I'd have more, effort, uh, more uh, uh, freedom to choose the pillow that I want, like its firmness, its color, and its shape. But at the end of the day, whichever approach I would end up choosing, I had to understand the individual properties of each pillow in order to build a successful fork. This idea forms the basis of nanotechnology. But first of all, what even is nanotechnology? Well, let's break the word down. Nanotechnology. Let's start with the part that most of us know a little bit about. Technology, known as the science of crafts. It involves the processes and techniques used to make things, ranging from the stage right here to the shoes that you're wearing. Okay, well, next part, nano. Well, the nanometer is actually just a unit of measure, uh, just like the centimeter. So when we want to convert one centimeter to a meter, we divide by 100, which is basically just one and two zeros. Now, let's convert one nanometer to one meter. Well, same thing. We're going to divide by one, but not three, not six, but nine zeros. I mean, that's pretty small. And just to give you an idea of how small we're going here, we'll do like a, a real life demonstration right now. Let's imagine the diameter of planet Earth. Or not imagine, let's just take it. It's around 13,000 kilometers. Now, we'll consider that our starting point, our one meter. Now, which object do you think is going to represent our one nanometer in comparison to the diameter of the Earth? Maybe a bunch of bean bags bundled up? Uh, maybe a football or something? Well, actually, I have the answer right here. Well, this marble right here represents one nanometer in comparison to the diameter of the entirety of planet Earth. That's pretty small. I don't think I need to tell you that. But, you know, yeah, it's pretty small. And that's why we consider a nanoparticle to be between one nanometer to a hundred nanometers. So one of these marbles to a hundred of these marbles compared to one to one meter, which is basically the diameter of the entirety of Earth. Okay, well, we understand how small we're going here, but what makes the nanoscale any different? I mean, you, you don't see people going around and doing talks about the wonders of the millimeter. Oh my gosh, guys, look how cool the centimeter is. So, what's so special about this nanometer thing? Well, the nanometer, actually, well, when we deal with things at the nanoscale, they start to act differently, not the way we expect them to. How? Well, I'll give you an example. Let's take this little marble again, right? Now, if I were to draw this marble, what do you think is going to happen? Let's see. If you predicted it falling onto the ground, well done. Now, if I were to ask for the reasoning behind this conclusion of yours, you'd probably say, well, this marble has a mass, so when you drop it, its weight acts on it, it falls to the ground. And you'd probably say the same conclusion for any other object I was going to drop, like this remote, for example. Because, you know, gravity is a thing. But if we were in the nanoscale right now, or this demonstration was in the nanoscale, things wouldn't exactly work out this way. But how? Well, I'll give you another example. Now, uh, the previous slide actually showed a golden bar, which was supposed to be shown, yeah? And, of course, I would have loved to have a, a golden bar with me today for demonstration purposes, but unfortunately, I do not own a golden bar. But nevertheless, this golden bar, well, it, you know, has a high melting point, it's a good conductor, but what's special about it is obviously its golden color, the one that we all are attracted to. Now, let's make this golden bar a bit smaller. These earrings, well, they're maybe around two to three centimeters, so 20 to 30 millimeters. They're small, but you can still see that golden color. You can still see it, it's pretty obvious. Now, let's make it even smaller to the micro scale. And no, that is gold. It's not expired as quick, like some people have told me before. It is gold, but the shininess is just not that clear. But the golden color is still there. 
Now let's enter the nanoscale. What? Yep, that is cold. That is still gold, just at the nanoscale. Now that's pretty strange. I mean, we've had standard scientific rules for hundreds of years that said specific objects absorb specific wavelengths of light and reflect other wavelengths. And that doesn't change regardless of size. I mean, if I had a blue ball with me, this blue ball absorbs all the light but reflects blue light, even if we have it down. So now, are we saying that these rules that we've had in textbooks for so many years just don't apply anymore? Yeah, pretty much. They just do not apply. We don't consider these rules anymore at the nanoscale, and they just do not apply anymore. But how does this strange phenomenon even happen? I mean, it's one thing to see it, but we need to understand why gold goes from looking gold into like pink, a pink liquid. Well, we mainly attribute these strange behaviors of nanoparticles to two things. Surface area and quantum size mechanics. Well, we'll start with the simpler option, surface area. If you think back to the golden bar, as we made it smaller and smaller, we were actually increasing its total surface area. Just like, for example, our body digests our food and increases the surface area in order to absorb it better. It's a common mechanism. And you see, if we make things, you know, smaller and smaller, increase their surface area, the more likely they are to react with their surroundings, meaning that this could affect properties such as conductivity and other things like that. Now this is when things get really, really strange. When we enter the world of quantum dots. Basically, I'll make this simple. The bulk properties of any material, and properties meaning uh, melting point, boiling point, strength, color, all this stuff, that's all properties. If we, like the bulk properties of any material is basically just the average forces of all the quantum forces that act on each atom in this material. So if we make this material smaller and smaller, we'll eventually reach a point where we can no longer average these forces because there's nothing to average from. And we have to deal with the behavior of each specific molecule or atom, which as we've seen with gold, could be completely different from when these atoms are together in their bulk form. And you see here, this is just an example of how we have new rules in science, things that we've never really thought of before. I mean, all these strange behaviors due to quantum dots and surface area really show that science is really never certain. But, okay, with all this talk about, you know, quantum size effects that only happen at the nanoscale and scientific approaches and all these things, you're probably thinking this nanotech thing is brand new. It's a product of the 21st century, right? Wait until you hear that we've actually been using nanotechnology since even the medieval ages. Now look at this, it's a beautiful piece of glass, uh, stained glass artwork from the Middle Ages. Medieval Ages, sorry. Now, if you look at the bottom, you can see the, the red colored glass. Well, the red colored glass is actually gold nanoparticles in the collodion form. Of course, I'm not saying that back then these artists knew what they were doing and they knew that they were using nanotech, but they still were using gold nanoparticles. I mean, okay, cool, we saw that it has a few applications, but is all this hype and research and money being spent on a technology that can change glass cutter and material transparency? What are we actually achieving at the end of the day? Well, no stained fabrics that self-clean. How? Well, when we mix in nanoparticles with fabrics, they actually alter the angle that the oil droplet makes with the fabric. So, for example, instead of the oil droplet going in like this, it goes in like this, for example. And at a certain point, this angle becomes so altered and so changed that it no longer spreads out into the fabric and just keeps intact. The oil droplet keeps intact and just falls down, meaning no staining, therefore no more constant washing. If your kid comes back from playing in the mud, you don't need to wash their clothes, which is why I'm saying that in a few years we're probably going to find that like more than half of the investors for this technology are going to be mothers, believe me when I say this. And nanotechnology even found its way into cosmetics. Sunscreens use zinc oxide and zinc, uh, titanium dioxide, which 
work by reflecting UV rays away from the skin. And they don't leave the space to look like most sunscreens do, so rest assured, you can take your second pictures without any sunburn. Remember those quantum dots that we were talking about back then? Well, actually, they moved from just, you know, experimentation to actual applications in imaging. And imaging is basically just sort of like a, a CT scan or MRI. These are all called imaging techniques. Well, now they're actually used in imaging. Researchers have found that these nanocrystals, so basically just the nanoparticles, can actually help us study the behavior of cells at a single molecular level. So we can see how the single cell behaves, how much it replicates, and so on. And if you think about it, this has enormous applications in the diagnosis and treatment of cancers, as even the tiniest tumors could be detected earlier on, which could save so many lives. And nanotechnology can help the environment too. So researchers use uh, water repellent uh, magnetic nanoparticles in oil spills, which mechanically remove the oil away from the water. And oil spills are just a huge environmental issue that we're still trying to figure out how to solve, but nanotechnologists just there like, hey, I can solve that for you. Now, let's think about a scenario that, or remember a scenario that most of us have probably gone through. Guests are coming over, and you're with your mom in the kitchen, and she asks you to get the top, or the glassware, that's only reserved for guests. And you know, tension is high, you're sort of sweating, you're like, oh my god, I need to be careful. But for some reason, it's always placed at a weird angle at like the top cabinet, and you can't really reach it that well. So you know, you just go, you try to reach to it, and take it out, and then it slips from your hand, and push, it breaks. Of course, I don't think I need to tell you guys what happens after that because we all know how the situation ends with your mom literally catching you red-handed in the kitchen. But let's just rewind or take the same exact scenario, but we'll say that the, uh, the glassware was fortified by nanotechnology. Now the same thing's gonna happen, but first, you know, you go and reach for it, slips from your hand, breaks. Actually, no, the last part is not true. It doesn't break. But how? I mean, ceramics and glass are really brittle materials. If you apply strong enough force to them, they just break and they don't go back to their original shape. They're not elastic. But that's not necessarily the case, again, in the nanoscale. Here you go, nanotechnology again, coming in and ruining all our previous knowledge, but it really doesn't. And this shows how much nanotechnology can be applied to our daily lives. But now you're probably thinking, okay, this situation is becoming, you know, a bit too dreamy, right? This is not really feasible, this whole nanotech thing. Wait until you find out that we actually use nanotechnology today, or you actually have it between your hands. This little guy here, this smartphone, wouldn't have existed with this here. A processor or a central processing unit which uses nanotechnology. Now here's that processor's great, great, great grandpa from ages ago. I mean, no shame or anything, but that probably would not have fit into this tiny phone right here. Now, maybe you're thinking that we're straying far too much from nature, right? We're dealing with things that we really shouldn't be dealing with and we should just leave it to Mother Nature to, you know, work out these things for us. Wait until you hear that Mother Nature herself has been utilizing or using nanotechnology for thousands of years. Well, remember how we were uh, gushing about how cool nose stain fabrics were and how awesome they were at self-cleaning? Well, these lotus leaves have been utilizing the same mechanism for thousands of years. Well, how do they do this? The cell, uh, the, the nanostructures on the surface of the leaf minimize the adhesion of the water droplet to the leaf itself. So it's the same mechanism as the uh, nose stain shirts, therefore leaving the leaf sort of, uh, sort of not moist anymore, which helps the leaf to fight off pathogens and such. Now, this is just one example of how we can also draw from nature and see how she does her thing and use it to help and improve our own technology. But now, with all this talk about, you know, nanotech and all the cool applications of nanotechnology, we need to remember that this new level in science, with its new rules, just don't just include sciencey things, but also ethical and social implications. For example, there's a multitude of research 
research about the potential applications of nanotechnology, uh, the behavior of particles at the nanoscale, but there's a clear lack of research solely focusing on the impacts of nanotechnology. While it's nice to be all dreamy and sort of, you know, think about all the beauty of the nano world, we need to understand that we can control these effects and that we must do that. For example, nanosilver particles, which have been found that if they get into our water treatment plants, they stop the treatment process. And that is incredibly dangerous because it affects ourselves and our environment. Now, well, this actually is due to the lack of regulation on nanoproducts. As up to today, there is no international regulation of nanoproducts, no internationally agreed uh, toxicity testing system for nanomaterials, and not even internationally agreed definition of nanotechnology. But you're probably thinking, oh my god, Lila, you know, you got me interested, hopefully, in this nanotech thing, but now you're telling me all these dangers and all these risks and all these bad things related to it. Well, yeah, but it's not supposed to make you shun nanotech because it's not something to stay in a state of fear for. You must not let that, you know, stop you from continuing research as to, like more and more organizational bodies around the world are starting to recognize the importance of nanotech regulations such as the FDA in the United States of America and hopefully a much more. Okay, well, now I've given you a little tour of the nano world. Hopefully at least one area of nanotech got your interest. And as you've seen, the nano world is not exclusively for chemists, physicists, or biologists. It's for anyone with an interest to make anything nano. So go out there, look some stuff up for yourself, because maybe in a few years, you'll be the first person to apply nanotech to a certain field. After all, the smaller we go, the bigger the possibilities. Thank you.